So now that we're moving into more of a focus on concentration meditation, it seems appropriate to talk about dealing with uh, distraction, uh, dealing with thinking, unnecessary thinking. Uh, and most of the thinking we do is unnecessary. Uh, and in particular, what I'd like to look at is the Viteka Santana Sutta, which is the Sutta number 20 from the Majjhima Nikaya. Um, so this is a Sutta that I refer to quite often, uh, as it gives five very practical, direct ways of dealing with distracting, unwholesome, or un unwanted thinking during meditation. Um, who here remembers me referring to this sutta before? Okay, at least one person. The rest of you apparently haven't been paying attention because I talk about it all the time. Um, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe it's just that audience participation isn't a thing during this retreat. I'm not sure. It's like, who's still breathing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who's paying attention? Okay, a few people. That's encouraging. Uh, the rest of you just do whatever you're doing. Uh, so, so the sutta begins. So this is uh, the Vitaka Santana Sutta. I translate as the stabilization of thought. So Vitaka means thought, and Santana means stabilizing. Uh, literally, it's from. The, the prefix sung means together, and tana means um, standing or staying. So santana means staying together, uh, uh, standing together. So it has the connotation of stabilizing, keeping it steady. Uh, so this is not actually about eliminating thought, uh, but rather it's about um, controlling the thought process so that it can be useful for what we're trying to do. So the sutta begins, Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati at Jeta's Grove in Anantapindika's park. There the Blessed One addressed the monks. Monks. Auspicious sir, those monks replied to the Blessed One. So, I say this all the time, but it's worth saying once again. Uh, the Buddha was speaking to monks on this occasion because he himself was a monk, and he was frequently surrounded by monks. Um, but that doesn't mean that his, that his advice is limited to monks. So this advice is relevant to anyone who's sincerely interested in making progress towards awakening. Uh, so don't get tripped up on the word monk. The Blessed One said this, Monks, there are five objects of awareness to be given attention to from time to time by a monk who is committed to developing a heightened mind. What five? Here are monks, when harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion arise in a monk due to a particular object of awareness, from paying attention to a particular object of awareness, then that monk is to shift his attention from that object of awareness to another object of awareness that is connected with something wholesome. Does that make sense? Okay. So one person on board, 20 people not on board. So apparently this needs a bit of explanation. So you're sitting here, you're trying to meditate, and then you start thinking, God, I really want some ice cream. What is that? That's a harmful, unwholesome thought connected with desire. Or you're sitting here thinking, I really hate all this pain in my body. What's that? That's a harmful, unwholesome thought connected with aversion. Um, or you're sitting there thinking, ah, if only I could go outside and run and play in the sun, then I would be happy. What's that? A harmful, unwholesome thought connected with delusion. Uh, hint, going outside will not make you happy. It'll probably have the opposite effect in this weather. Um, so, basically, uh, it, this, this statement, harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion, that's kind of shorthand for any thoughts that arise during meditation that are pulling us away from the path to awakening. Uh, 
anything that hinders our progress towards awakening. So things connected with desire and aversion uh, tend to be the most obvious and, and usually the most prominent. Uh, so the ones that make the biggest impact on our minds are the ones that are connected with uh, desire, desire usually for pleasant things or for things we want. Aversion, uh, so a distaste or dislike for things that we uh, don't want, uh, that we'd rather avoid. Uh, and then delusion is a, a very wide category that uh, just relates to getting caught up in any thoughts which are confusing, unnecessary, uh, which are not uh, based on right view, which are based on wrong view. Uh, and that's, uh, again, that's a huge category. But broadly speaking, uh, again, anything which does not lead towards awakening, uh, if we're getting wrapped up in it, then that's an indication that delusion is operating, that we're, we're under the influence of delusion. So in the context of our meditation practice, anything other than our meditation object uh, is a, would fit in this category, because it's preventing us from making progress towards awakening. Now one exception we can make to that is if we are uh, engaging in wholesome thoughts uh, or wholesome mental patterns aside from our normal meditation object, with the intention of developing wholesome mind states uh, that are supportive. Uh, so for example, if you're trying to do mindfulness of the body and, and you notice you're having a very difficult time and you keep getting dragged down into irritation or you're getting caught up in pain, then you might switch your attention to doing loving kindness for a period of time. Uh, or you might start reflecting on your own virtue. Or, or you might recollect the, the qualities of the Buddha. Or you might uh, bring up gratitude uh, for friends or family, uh, which is, uh, technically speaking, it's not your, your, the meditation that you're currently working on, but it's helping to produce a quality of joy and contentment in the mind, so that then, once you've re-established uh, a certain amount of happiness in the mind, then you can bring your attention back to your primary meditation object. So that's fine. Um, that's using thought in a wholesome way. It's using thinking in a wholesome way. So Buddhist practice is not about eliminating thought, or getting rid of thought, or silencing the mind. Uh, though silencing the mind does have its use. But rather it's about controlling the mind, controlling the thought process, so that it's always oriented towards that which is wholesome. So that's always producing beneficial mind states that help us make progress on the path. So, the Buddha continues, when he shifts his attention from that object of awareness to another object of awareness that is connected with something wholesome, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned and disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally stable, settled, unified, and concentrated. Monks, just like a skilled carpenter or apprentice carpenter, strikes away, knocks out, and does away with a coarse peg using a refined peg. In the same way, monks, when harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion arise in a monk due to a particular object of awareness, then that monk has to shift his attention from that object to another object that is connected with something wholesome. Um, so, the simile the Buddha gives here is, so if you have a, a piece of wood, and there's a, currently a peg in that piece of wood. Uh, then you can take another peg, place it on the first one, and just whack it with your hammer. And it'll knock out the other peg. Uh, and replace it with the new one. Uh, so maybe you, uh, maybe there's uh, a bit of soft wood uh, is plugging a hole in a piece of wood. And you want to replace it with hardwood because hardwood is more durable. Or maybe it matches the pattern better for whatever reason. So then you just put your new hardwood peg up on the old one and just whack. And it knocks the old one out and puts the new one in its place. So in the same way, when there's an unwholesome thought occupying the mind, then uh, we just knock it out using uh, a wholesome thought, replacing it with a wholesome thought. So uh, if we're sitting here and we're getting dragged down and thinking like, oh God, I really hate this.
this retreat. I don't know why I came. This is so boring and so painful and so awful, and I hate the monk. He's so annoying. <laughs> and then, why can't I do something else? And then it's like, wait a minute. Why don't I practice love and kindness meditation? And, and then we start thinking, may everyone be happy, may everyone be happy, may everyone be happy. And joy starts to arise. Uh, a wholesome state of mind arises, that wholesome state of mind of, of loving kindness, of benevolence. And then from that we start to experience uh, contentment, rapture, concentration, uh, equanimity. Uh, so the mind starts to produce a whole constellation of wholesome mind states to accompany that wholesome thought that we're switching our focus to. So in this, this example, so the mind is currently occupied with unwholesome thoughts. So we just produce a wholesome thought and just knock out the unwholesome thoughts using the wholesome thought. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, simple example. So it, it, it requires attentiveness, so being attentive to the mind, noticing when we're getting caught up in, in unwholesome or unnecessary thinking. Uh, and when we notice that, then to intentionally produce wholesome, good, beneficial thought and uh, focus all our attention on that, uh, just to eliminate the old one by replacing it with, with a new one that's wholesome, that's, that's useful for our meditation practice. So that's the first technique the Buddha recommends, replacing. Replacing an unwholesome thought with a wholesome thought. In the second category, monks, when that monk shifts his attention from that object of awareness to another object that is connected with something wholesome, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, so if you tried the first thing and it didn't work, um, you're still sitting there thinking about how much you hate the retreat and how much you want ice cream and, and how much happier you would be if you became a Sufi nun or whatever it is you want to be. Uh, who here actually wants to be a Sufi nun? I don't know where that example came from. What's a Sufi nun? Sufi, so Sufi is the mystical branch of Islam. Um, I don't know if they even have nuns. Do they have nuns? Okay. Islam doesn't have a monastic Well, then your wish to be a Sufi nun is guaranteed to fail. Unless you're planning, unless you're planning to start something new. Which, if that's what you want, go for it. It won't make you happy, but go for it. Um, so, if you tried the first technique and it didn't work, uh, there's still unwholesome <coughs> thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion arising in the mind. The Buddha continues. Then that monk is to consider the disadvantages of those thoughts, thinking, these thoughts are unwholesome, these thoughts are blameworthy, these thoughts result in dissatisfaction. When he considers the disadvantages of those thoughts, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned and disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally stable, settled, unified, and concentrated. Monks, just like a young woman or young man who is naturally fond of adornments, would be upset, humiliated, and disgusted if the corpse of a snake, a dog, or a human was tied to their neck. In the same way, when that monk shifts his attention from that object of awareness to another that is connected with something wholesome, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to consider the disadvantages of those thoughts, thinking, these thoughts are unwholesome, these thoughts are blameworthy, these thoughts result in dissatisfaction. So the technique here is to... Uh, Reflect on the drawbacks of engaging in unwholesome thoughts. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, so we're noticing, we're sitting here thinking like, man, I really hate all these people. They're such obnoxious. It's, wait a minute, wait a minute, what am I doing? We stop and reflect, what am I doing? I'm fueling my aversion, I'm fueling hatred and resentment, I'm fueling anger. What is that? Well, it's uh, unwholesome, it's blameworthy. Uh, it's something which, uh, let's see, what does he say? Um, these thoughts are unwholesome, blameworthy, and result in dissatisfaction. Uh, so, reflecting that when we indulge in these thoughts of anger, irritation, resentment, and, uh, and so on, um, what we're doing is we're pulling ourselves away from awakening. 
So that's a, the first critical thing to reflect on. It's reflecting that as long as we're engaging in these unwholesome thoughts, we are, not only are we not moving towards enlightenment, we're moving away from enlightenment. We're also producing mental patterns which make us unhappy immediately. Now don't take my word for it. Just the next time you're caught up in anger or desire or uh, the next time you're spacing out, just, just look. What does that actually feel like? And you'll notice it's, it feels quite uncomfortable. It feels quite unpleasant. It's not enjoyable at all. So it's immediately un uh, unpleasant. It's immediately unsatisfying. And then it also forms the basis for all manner of awful things. What's the basis of every war throughout human history? Greed, hatred, delusion. Uh, I challenge you to point to any war which wasn't started on the basis of one of those three things. Uh, what's the basis of all interpersonal conflict? Greed, hatred, delusion. What's the basis of pretty much everything awful that ever happens in the world? Greed, hatred, delusion. So as long as we're fueling those things in our mind, then we are contributing to the awfulness of the world. But every moment that we work to remove and eliminate those things from our mind, then we're contributing to the goodness of the world, to the purity of the world. We're making the world a better place. Um, so reflecting on the drawbacks and disadvantages of engaging in unwholesome thinking, and not in a self-condemning way. So not thinking, I am a bad person because I think these thoughts. But just thinking, these thoughts are harmful, so I'm not going to get involved in them. I'm not going to participate. Why would I be involved with them? Uh, again, the, the simile the Buddha uses is, is quite evocative. So it's like you have a, a young, beautiful person who, uh, who likes jewelry and cosmetics, and, and, and you go up and you hang a dead snake around their neck. So it's like we're sitting here basking in our magnificence, and we suddenly realize there's a dead snake around our neck. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to walk around all day, oh, look at my dead snake? No, we're going to take it off right away. The moment we realize we've got a rotting snake hanging around our neck, we're going to take it off. We recognize this is disgusting. I don't want this. Uh, this is not good. This is not appropriate. So we remove it. So reflecting on the drawbacks of engaging in unwholesome, uh, unwholesome thinking can be a very effective way of counteracting it. Um, also, in the context of a, a, a meditation retreat, you can also reflect that you're wasting time, um, that we have this, this rare and precious opportunity to spend a week dedicating ourselves to meditation. So every moment that we spend, even if it's not terribly unwholesome, even if it's not wrapped up in greed and hatred, uh, even if we're just wasting time spacing out and thinking about Game of Thrones or uh, Walking Dead or whatever it is people think about, I don't know. Uh, what do people think about? Mainly those two things. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's your comprehensive list. I would add on ice cream because that's what I tend to think about. Um, so just noticing as much time as we, as we waste thinking about these unnecessary frivolous things, um, that's all time that uh, we're not, that, that's all when we're not making good use of this time. So who here goes on multiple week-long retreats every year? Okay, not very many people. So this is your once-a-year opportunity. Do you want to spend your once-a-year opportunity thinking about Game of Thrones? You can think about Game of Thrones the other 51 weeks of the year. Like when you're supposed to be working, you can just space out at your desk thinking about Game of Thrones. That's fine. I don't mind. It's probably better than whatever they're paying you to do. And they'll still pay you, by the way. <laughs> uh, but here, you're not getting paid, so you can't use that excuse. But rather, we're making an active effort to develop the qualities of mind that lead towards unconditional happiness. And if we don't try, it won't happen. So it's quite possible, as I said at the beginning of this retreat, it's quite possible to waste an entire week-long retreat. It's possible to waste a whole three-month retreat if you want to. So that's a little more challenging. 
You start to run out of frivolous things to think about after the first three or four weeks. But a week-long retreat, <laughs> a week-long retreat, you can quite easily fill up a week thinking about all kinds of random silly things. So just watching that, watching that tendency to waste time, and, and really, when we notice it happening, just remind ourselves, this is a waste of time. At best, it's a waste of time. At worst, I'm actually pulling myself away from enlightenment. I'm, I'm pointing the mind away from awakening. I'm pointing the mind just back into the uh, swampy morass of suffering that uh, I've been mired in for countless lifetimes. Instead, we want to be pointing towards awakening. We want to orient the mind towards unconditional happiness, uh, towards true wisdom, true understanding. So that's the second technique. The second technique is reflecting. Uh, reflecting on the drawbacks of the unwholesome or distracting thoughts. The Buddha continues, When that monk is considering the disadvantages of those thoughts, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to ignore those thoughts and pay no attention to them. This is my favorite of these techniques, by the way. Uh, when he ignores those thoughts and pays no attention to them, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned and disappear. With their abandoning, the mind becomes internally stable, settled, unified, and concentrated. Just like a person with eyes who wants to stop seeing objects that have come into his field of view might close his eyes or look away. In the same way, when that monk is considering the disadvantages of those thoughts, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, they are abandoned and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally stable, settled, unified, and concentrated. So this one is non-participation. So this is an extremely direct way of handling any unwholesome or distracting thoughts. Just stop. <clears throat> stop participating in those thoughts. If you just come to a full halt, stop feeding the thoughts, stop fueling them, stop engaging with them, stop participating with them, they go away. Usually, immediately, the thoughts disappear. The moment we stop feeding the thoughts, they disappear. It's kind of like, uh, when we're engaging in unwholesome thoughts, it's kind of like a guy with a water bottle, like whacking himself on the head, going like, God, I wish someone would stop hitting me on the head. Well, you just stop. That's all you have to do. Just stop hitting yourself on the head. That's exactly what this technique is like. When you realize, like, ah, oh, what are all these terrible thoughts in my head? Just stop thinking those thoughts and they go away. We are producing those thoughts. It's not like, it's not like Giovanna is like sneaking up and planting evil thoughts in our head. We are planting those thoughts. It's us. It's not her. I don't think so anyway. We're doing it to ourselves. So when we realize we're doing it to ourselves, we realize we can stop at any moment. At any moment we can just say to ourselves, okay, that's enough. Uh, I've spent three hours thinking about Game of Thrones today. I think that's enough. I'm going to stop now. And we stop. Simple as that. So this technique is extraordinarily simple and straightforward, but it also tends to be a bit challenging uh, if you're not used to, to using this technique. Um, for example, I remember uh, uh, a year or two after I started meditating, <coughs> I was talking to my brother about meditation practice, and, and I, I mentioned, like, uh, oh, you, uh, when you practice meditation, you can get to a point where you can stop your thinking. And he was like, that's impossible. There's no way. Yeah. He's, uh, he was like, it's impossible to stop thinking. Um, and it's amazing how many people believe this. It's amazing how many people believe that the mind is just constantly thinking and there's no other option. Uh, so... Uh, if we are caught up in that, then the other techniques the Buddha recommends in the sutta might be more helpful for us. But if we've had some taste of what it's like to stop, 
then that's what I recommend as your first option. When you notice a thought arising in the mind, just stop. There's no need to get wrapped up in it. What instead tends to happen is something arises, uh, like uh, the, the thought of, of ice cream arises, and, and instead of just letting it dissipate, we start thinking like, ah oh, yes, it's creamy and cool and sweet, and, and it's so great with this and so great with that. And we start building the story in our head and getting wrapped up in it, or, or we start thinking about how much we hate mm, cats. I don't know why anyone would hate cats, but assuming you hated cats, you might st start thinking like, I hate cats so much, they snore during meditation, and they, they do all these annoying things, and they keep scratching up the floor, and, and, and you just start building this whole story in your head, or, or, or you start getting caught up in uh, spacing out, uh, or you get caught up in uh, just thinking about random things, like, oh, I wonder who was in that car that just drove by, uh, or, oh, I wonder what that big building in the distance is, or we just start filling up the mind with all kinds of noise. The moment you notice what you're doing, just stop. Let it come to an end. Just like that. And you'll realize that that internal silence is always accessible. That there's a vast spaciousness in the mind that's always there. If we just stop filling it with noise, we'll realize it's there and it's been there all along. So that's the third technique, stopping. Uh, the third one, uh, the fourth one that the Buddha gives here, you know, this one says, when that monk is ignoring those thoughts and paying no attention to them, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to pay attention to the stabilizing of... Ooh, this is kind of an awkward translation. Pay attention to the stabilizing of... It says here, the stabilizing of the thought producers of those thoughts. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Um, the simile here uh, clarifies this quite a bit more. Um, monks, just like a person who is walking quickly might think, why do I walk quickly? Perhaps I should walk slowly. So he walks slowly. He might think, why do I walk slowly? Perhaps I should stand still. So he stands still. He might think, why am I standing? Perhaps I should sit down. So he sits down. He might think, why am I sitting? Perhaps I should lay down. So he lays down. In this way, monks, a person replaces coarse postures with refined postures. In the same way, monks, when that monk is ignoring those thoughts and paying no attention to them, etc. So, the simile here is of, of someone who's, who's hurrying, they're rushing forward, right? and then they start slowing down until they finally come to a halt, right? and eventually put it down completely. So, that's what he's pointing to here. He's, he's pointing to when we're when we're running full tilt with a thought, we're just completely wrapped up in a thought pattern. We're just like, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. Start slowing down a little bit. One interesting thing you can do is when you notice these thoughts going in your mind and you haven't had any success in getting them to stop using other methods, first start actively uh, joining in those thoughts. So you're noticing, I hate this, I hate this, join in. I hate this, I hate this, and then just start slowing it down a little bit in your mind. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. And start noticing the gaps between the words in your mind. I hate Notice the gaps between the words and the thought. And eventually you'll recognize that the thought is unnecessary. You can just inhabit those silent spaces. You can just inhabit the gaps between the thoughts. And then the <coughs> thoughts start to, to dissipate of their own accord. So this is a, a slightly more roundabout way of approaching the problem. 
Um, so if, if the more straightforward, head-on methods, the first three that he recommends, aren't working for us, then we can harness the thought, take, take hold of the thought, and just start slowing things down a bit. So slowing down the production of the thought, slowing down the rate of production of the thought. Another way of taking this is uh, when we're caught up in, in an unwholesome mind state um, and just immediately going in the opposite direction seems like too much, then we can start slowly turning the thought around. So, for example, if we're caught up with hatred uh, towards someone like, I really hate that person, they breathe so loudly, and then start turning around and like, Oh, it's really sad that person breathes so loudly. They must be having such a hard time with their respiratory tract. And then, so it's, it's starting to turn it from, from hatred towards pity. And then slowly turning towards like, Oh, uh, poor guy, he's probably not feeling terribly well. I hope he feels better soon. And then right, so we might actually make it all the way into genuine compassion and loving kindness. Like, may he be happy and healthy. Uh, may nothing... May no harm come to him. May he be freed of his illness and his difficulties. And may he eventually attain complete awakening. So we can slowly turn it around. Uh, or if you're, you're thinking about someone who's really, uh, really upset you, it's like, uh, oh, he's such an awful person. It's like, well, again, just start shifting it. Like, oh, it's, it's so sad. He upsets so many people and he, I don't think he even realizes it. I don't think he even realizes there's, there's another way to be. Uh, than to, to be in this way that's always angering or irritating people. So starting to turn the mind around uh, until we can come all the way back to the wholesome. Um, or if we're caught up in, in greed and obsessiveness. So maybe we're, we're just sitting here thinking like, I really want brownies, I really want brownies. Why do I have to sit here and do all this like boring stuff? when I could just walk to the store and get brownies. And then start turning around, it's like, well, I wonder who else would really like some brownies? <laughs> Actually, I bet there's a lot of people who would really like brownies. I hope they get some brownies. Wouldn't that make them happy? After this retreat, I'm going to go out and buy a big box of brownies and share it with all my friends. And then we're like, okay, problem solved. And then we can put it down. Um, so we've taken it from pure selfish greed to... Uh, starting to consider others, uh, all the way to wishing others to be happy, and then actually formulating a plan based on generosity and compassion. And then we can stop. It's like, okay, problem solved. The brownie issue is solved. We'll take care of that in a few days. So, and then, then since it's done, we just don't need to think about it. Um, the next time that the brownie thought arises, we're like, well, I've already got a plan for that. So I don't need to think about that one anymore. Sorted. Taken care of. Um, so these are a few ways of approaching this. So slowing down the production of thoughts, reducing the production of thought that's unwholesome. Mm -hmm. Another way of approaching this is reducing the intensity. So, for example, if you're caught up in, like, full-blown boiling rage, try to just cool that off down to, like, simmering discontent, or simmering resentment. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. Simmering resentment is better than boiling rage. Um, so then from simmering resentment, we're like, well, how can I cool this off a bit? Maybe to just like tepid discontent. And then from tepid discontent, maybe we can actually move all the way into apathy. And from apathy, then we can start to shift towards genuine equanimity and contentment. So it's just slowly reducing the intensity of the unwholesome emotions or mind states. So don't expect to become perfect right away. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes practice. And in, in the process, we're going to go through many imperfect states. But if those imperfect states are progressing in the right direction, that's good enough. Stick with it. Just make sure you're pointed in the right direction. So that's the fourth one. Now, so the fourth one is slowing. Um, then the fifth one, uh, the imagery here is also quite evocative. Part of why I love this sutta is because the, the, the similes are really, really on point. There's one thing that Buddha did really well, he did similes really well. 
So he says, when that monk is paying attention to the stabilizing of the thought production of those thoughts, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to clench his teeth, press his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrain, subdue, and overpower the mind. When he clenches his teeth, presses his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrains, subdues, and overpowers the mind, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned and disappear. With their abandoning, the mind becomes internally stable, settled, unified, and concentrated. Monks, just like a strong man might grab a weaker man's head, neck, or shoulder and restrain, subdue, and overpower him, uh, in the same way, monks, uh, when that monk is paying attention to the stabilizing, etc., uh, that monk is to clench his teeth, press his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrain, subdue, and overpower the mind. So, this is uh, the last resort, but if we get to a point where we've tried everything else, and it just doesn't seem to be working, the mind is still a chaotic disaster zone. Uh, then what we can do is start actively using the mind. Start actively using the thinking process to just crush everything else out of the mind. Just push everything else out. Uh, so one way that uh, I tend to recommend for this is the repetition of a, a word or a phrase. Um, so I like to use the word focus. Uh, if it gets to a point where my mind is just completely full of crap and I can't seem to get it to settle down, then I'll just start repeating focus, 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 focus in my mind. Just keep repeating focus, 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 focus. And just focus wholeheartedly on the repetition of that word. Uh, as if you were shouting it at full volume inside your head, not out loud. So inside your head, as if you're shouting at full volume over and over again, focus, 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 focus. And you'll get to a point where eventually that's the only thing left in the mind. If you really give it your full effort, there's no space for anything else. And you'll get to a point where, uh, where that's the only thing in the mind. And then you can let it go. Then you can let it stop and you'll be left with a quiet mind. You'll be left with a focused mind, a mind that's ready to meditate, that's ready uh, to do the work that's in front of us. Um, if you don't like the word focus, that's fine. You can pick something else that works for you. Um, a very common one in the Thai Force tradition is, is uh, repeating uh, Buddha. So the, the, the Buddha's title, so just repeating that over and over in your mind. Um, so if that works for you, that's fine. Uh, if you'd rather repeat something uh, a little bit longer, uh, let go, let go, let go, equanimity, equanimity, contentment, contentment, happiness, happiness, uh, whatever you like is okay as long as it has a suitably wholesome meaning. Um, so you don't want to start repeating something disturbing or harsh. Um, because that's just going to stir up the mind. Um, you want something with a suitably uh, uh, wholesome meaning, something, something peaceful or something related to uh, the cultivation of the path to awakening. Um, so that's the fifth one. So the fifth one is, uh, you might call it crushing, given that the simile the Buddha uses is about crushing, or overpowering, subduing. Subduing might be a better word. Um, then the Buddha wraps up. Um, uh, monks, when harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion arise in a monk due to a particular object of awareness, then when that monk shifts his attention from that object to another object that is connected with something wholesome, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts are abandoned and they disappear. Or when he considers the disadvantages of those thoughts, when he ignores those thoughts and pays no attention to them, when he pays attention to slowing down the production of those thoughts, when he clenches his teeth, presses his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrains, subdues, and overpowers the mind, 
then those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned and disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally stable, settled, unified, and concentrated. Monks, this is called a monk who is in control of all of his patterns of thought. He will think whatever thought he wishes to think. He will not think whatever thought he does not wish to think. Craving has been severed, the fetters have been removed, and through the appropriate understanding of conceit, dissatisfaction has been eliminated. This is what the Blessed One said. Satisfied, those monks delighted in the Blessed One's speech. So the Buddha here is uh, wrapping up here. He's indicating that when we make an effort to train the mind in this way, then we can gain complete control of our thinking process to the point where, as he says, we can think what we want to think and not think what we don't want to think. So that, uh, that experience where we, we sometimes feel like our mind is out of control. Well, the reason it feels like it's out of control is because we're not making the effort to control it. So if we train the mind, then we'll have a well-trained mind. It's really as simple as that. Well, in theory, it's as simple as that. In practice, it's a lot more challenging. But in theory, it's, it's straightforward. If we train the mind, then we will have a well-trained mind. If we control the mind, then our mind will be completely controlled. Uh, and uh, also the Buddha is pointing to the importance of this as part of the path to awakening and that he, he ends with indicating that when we fully eliminate the tendency towards unwholesome thoughts uh, then uh, with the elimination of the tendency towards unwholesome thoughts then the mind is completely fixed uh, on the course to awakening uh, it cannot be reversed or changed from that course uh, so to completely control the modes of thought, then, is inseparable from the path to awakening. So, that's this discourse. Um, I think that's all I have to say for the time being. <laughs>